Years ago, at uh, theaters and plays, when a person got sick, someone would ask the question, is there a doctor in the house? And the doctor would save those who were sick, but at other times, despite his or her medical skill, they would lose a few. <clears throat> While a doctor's medical skills can help the body, they can do little to help the soul. But this morning, <clears throat> I want to declare that I know a doctor above all doctors who can heal both body and soul, and that doctor is the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> he didn't get his degree from Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. <clears throat> he got his qualifications from heaven. <clears throat> and church, great things happen when Jesus is in the house. And he is in our midst even now. And in today's message, we will see how the steadfast faith of four men did what was needed to get their friend to Jesus so that he could experience an amazing miracle of healing in his body and a transformation in his soul. And the takeaway thought that I want us to consider, the theme that I want us to appropriate into our lives is that to be transformed by the message and the miracles of the Messiah, we need to put our faith in Christ Jesus. We need to receive his forgiveness for our sins and we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. Those are the three thoughts that I want us to take home from this message. And so please turn with me to Mark chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 to 12. But let's start by exploring this overcrowded house in verses 1 and 2. When he, Jesus, had come back to Capernaum, several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Now, for the most part, Capernaum was a sleepy town. But since great things happen when Jesus shows up, the house here was packed out. It was crowded with people, people eager to hear Jesus' words, people eager to witness his powerful works. And it's interesting, Mark is the only gospel to mention four men bringing the paralytic to Jesus. Verse 3 and 4, And they came bringing him a paralytic, carried by four men, being unable to get, him, to, get to him because of the crowd. They removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Now these four men, they were not deterred by difficulties. They broke through barriers to bring this man to Jesus. And I want you to picture the scene with me. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the four men eager to get his sick friend to Jesus looked around, saw that the front entrance was crowded, couldn't get in there, and all of a sudden, an idea jumped into his head. The roof. Let's take him up there. Let's bust a hole in the middle and grab some ropes and lower him down in the middle of the crowds right in front of Jesus. <clears throat> Try to imagine if I were one of his friends, how I would respond to this method. <clears throat> Maybe I would say, that will never work. Maybe I would say, it sounds too risky. Besides, I don't think the guy who owns the house would want us busting a hole in his roof. <clears throat> There's a hymn written by Charles Wesley that says, Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees, and looks to that alone, and laughs at impossibilities, and cries, it shall be done. Faith is convinced that Jesus will meet 
our greatest need. And so it does whatever it needs to. It does whatever it takes to get to Jesus. And here the Lord saw the faith of these five men, and he rewarded their faith. If we go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer here says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. God rewards faith. And these men demonstrated what I call the five C's of faith. Now I want to go through those five C's briefly. The first is compassion. It was a compassionate faith that they had. These four men, they, they loved the paralytic. They loved this, this sick man on a, on, a, on a cot. And compelled by love, they led him to Jesus. <clears throat> in fact, if we read in Mark chapter 9, not Mark, Matthew chapter 9, verse uh, 36, this describes Jesus' motive for his ministry. It says, seeing the people, he, Jesus, felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. They were helpless, just like this paralytic. He was helpless. And yet the compassion of these four men led him to Jesus. Now, to bring a person to the Lord Jesus is a team effort, as we see here. It took four men. And no one gets the glory. And that leads us to the second C. Not only is it a compassionate faith, but it is a cooperative faith. There is a cooperation among the four guys. You see, some people may not be able to come to the Lord Jesus on their own unless others bring them. Perhaps we're paralyzed by regret. Maybe shame keeps us from coming to the Lord. Maybe our past sins. Maybe we have an overwhelming sense of guilt. Maybe there's fear. Things keep us from coming to the Lord. And this man on a cot, this sick man is a picture of a person who is not able to come to the Lord on his or her own. <clears throat> and also, speaking of a cooperative faith, these four men were united in their purpose to help this helpless man. Now I want you to suppose one of the four men opposed the method of you know, going up the stairs and putting a hole in, in, the, in the man's roof or in the, owner's, the homeowner's roof. Suppose he was opposed to this method and, and thwarted their efforts. Well, if that would be the case, the paralytic would not have been brought to Jesus. He would, he would not have known forgiveness. He would not have experienced healing. There had to be unity among these four men in their effort to bring this guy to Jesus. <clears throat> to bring a person to the Lord Jesus is a team effort. <clears throat> and while I'm on that, I'd like to just mention, even as we gather as God's people in life groups, as I mentioned, there's four, uh, three commitments that we have in life groups. We come to worship the Lord to engage in the Word of God, to minister to one another, and to join together in our efforts to bring our friends and family members to the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we share the burden of evangelism as a team. And so we're looking here at the five C's of faith. We see that these men had a compassionate faith. They were there was a cooperation among them in their faith. And thirdly, it was a creative faith. Creative faith employs unique methods to bring others to the Lord Jesus. You know, in regard to evangelism, someone said to D.L. Moody, a famous evangelist about 150 years ago, <clears throat> someone said to him, I don't like your methods. And Moody said, well, you know what? I don't like them either sometimes. What are your methods? 
And the person said, well, I don't have any. To which Moody replied, well, then I like my methods better than yours. <clears throat> you see, faith conceives those creative ways to achieve its goals. And sometimes the methods that we use to bring people to the Lord Jesus will be unusual. And that's because faith thinks outside the box. And so we're looking at the five C's of faith. It was a compassion faith. It was a cooperative faith. It was a creative faith. And fourthly, it was a courageous faith. You see, these men didn't care what others thought of them. They didn't care if they looked stupid. They moved forward in their quest, even though they may be mocked or accused or opposed. Faith is courageous. It does what is difficult. It goes to great lengths to bring people to the Lord Jesus. You know, these four men might have to pay the cost for the damage done to the roof of, this man, of the homeowner's house. <clears throat> but they were willing. I believe they would be willing to incur the cost. Now I want you to picture the scene. Here Jesus is talking to crowds, preaching the gospel, and all of a sudden they hear footsteps on the, on the roof. I remember several weeks ago I was preaching and I was hearing this noise behind me and I couldn't figure out what in the world was that noise. And it turns out I was a woodpecker pecking away at the wood. It's distracting. <clears throat> so they hear footsteps on the roof and then followed by digging sounds and then dirt and wood start falling down on the, on the crowd below and, and then the blue sky breaks through and down comes this man on a stretcher load by ropes and, and there would be scribes there. You know, they're sitting there and they're probably dusting themselves off in disgust, shouting at these men to stop because they're distracting this important meeting. <clears throat> and then the owner seeing this thing happens, probably thinking about the cost to repair the roof. But you know what? Faith doesn't concern itself with these things. Faith is courageous. It refuses to be thwarted. It is committed to bringing their friend to Jesus. <clears throat> and so this faith is fearless when faced with problems. Five C's of faith, compassion, cooperation, creativity, courage, and lastly, conviction. What I mean by that is they were convinced that Jesus could and would heal the man. They were convinced the paralytic man was not going to walk out, was going to walk out of the house. <clears throat> In the same way, we must be convinced that when we bring people to the Lord Jesus, and I have to say that the people need to be willing, this paralytic may not have been willing initially, but perhaps the four friends convinced him <clears throat> that if he went to Jesus, he would be healed. And, and finally, he agrees to it. And these four men brought him to the Lord. They have to, when we bring people to the Lord Jesus, they have to agree to come. You can't bring people against their will. <clears throat> but the thing is that faith is convinced that when we bring willing people to the Lord Jesus, the Lord will meet their greatest need. <clears throat> so what we're seeing here is that to be transformed by the message and the miracles of the Messiah, we need a faith that comes to the Lord Jesus. And secondly, we also need to be forgiven of our sin. You see, Jesus had authority over sickness and Satan, but the question is, does he have authority over sin? And to show that he does, Jesus proclaimed forgiveness to the paralytic. In verse 5, Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I'm trying to put myself in this situation. When the four men heard Jesus say, your sins are forgiven, they may have thought, wait a minute. We went through all this trouble to bring this man to you, Jesus. We brought him for healing, not for forgiveness. 
<clears throat> but you see, Jesus sees what we don't see. <clears throat> the secret of this man's soul was not hidden from the Lord. <clears throat> Jesus was pointing out <clears throat> that our greatest problem is not sickness, but sin. And Jesus deals with the greater problem first. You see, this man's sin was far more serious than his sickness. <clears throat> so God's miracle here, the great miracle that the Lord Jesus performed, is to forgive this man's sin. And forgiveness is a blessed word. Especially for a sin-burdened soul. I can remember when I finally experienced the forgiveness of God. The debt paid. The guilt gone. The conscience cleansed. Now we may be concerned with other things. Our health. Our finances. Our marriage. Our children. And these are important concerns. But the Lord's greatest concern is the problem of sin. And that needs to be dealt with more than anything else and before anything else. <clears throat> Forgiveness meets our deepest need. And I'll show you why, or scriptures will show you why. If we go to Isaiah 59, <clears throat> verse 2, <clears throat> notice what it says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. This is a serious place to be, to be separated from God. That's worse than cancer. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Of course, these other things are important and of concern, but the primary problem, the most urgent problem, is the sin problem. And so this man was forgiven of his sin. He had the promise of forgiveness, but his forgiveness was also protested. It was opposed. In verses 6 and 7, it says, but some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, who are these scribes? What do scribes do? Scribes copied the scriptures. They didn't have like the press, you know, the press that we have. You can't just mass produce <clears throat> scriptures. So they copied it by hand. And they also interpreted the scriptures. And the scribe, scribes determine how the laws and the traditions should be applied in the day-to-day -day life of the Jewish people. That was the role of the scribes. And it's interesting here, the scribes were sitting the fact that they were sitting shows the honor given to them. Because when you're in a crowded house, in a crowded room, everyone is standing, only men of status sit. And these honored scribes were in no mood to practice faith. They were finding fault. You see, they had already witnessed the authority of Jesus to heal diseases, as we read in chapter 1. They had witnessed the authority that Jesus had to drive out demons and to teach doctrines. And their error, though, was holding to the belief that Jesus was merely a man. And here a man was claiming to do something only God can do. And now I want you to think what it would be like if you had the authority to forgive the debts of any person who comes to you. What would it be like if you had power to forgive someone's car loan or their credit card debt or their business loans or even their mortgage? You'd be the most well-liked person around. <clears throat> well, you can forgive debts, <clears throat> but only those debts that are owed to you personally. And that would be because you were willing and able to assume the cost of the debt yourself. It would be presumptuous of me to forgive the debts that are owed to someone else. I couldn't do it. Our hearts may go out to a person in debt, but we can't pardon their debt for them. Only a creditor can do that. And he'd have to be willing to bear the debt himself. 
He, would, he alone has the power and authority to declare a debt forgiven. Well, why am I sharing all this? I'm sharing this because Jesus is forgiving the sin debt of a stranger, of a man he did not know. And all sin is against God, ultimately. And so only God can forgive. For example, if we go to Psalm 51, verse 4, here David is praying his prayer of confession. His sin was exposed. He committed sin against Bathsheba. He murdered her husband. And he can sin against himself. But it says in verse 4, against you, God, even though he had sinned against Bathsheba and against Uriah and against himself, ultimately he sinned against God and against you. You only have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. And so if Jesus forgives this man, it is because this man sinned against Jesus. And so the scribes understood the words of Jesus to forgive this man was a claim to be God. As they said, only God can forgive sins. Who is this man? <clears throat> and the other thing is in Old Testament times or in biblical times, God's forgiveness was granted in a temple in Jerusalem, not in a home in Galilee. It's unheard of. And also, God forgave in the context of the temple, the sacrifices, and the priesthood. So Jesus was not only claiming to be God, he was also upstaging the temple sacrifices and the priesthood. He was showing that it's possible to forgive sin without the sacrificial system. And this was way too much for the scribes to handle. This is why they say he is blasphemy. They could not handle this, what was going on in this home in Capernaum. You see, forgiveness of sin is an easy thing to claim. Saying, take up your mat and walk is also easy to say, but both are equally impossible to do. Verses 8 to 11, immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? And I think what Jesus is saying is both of these are equally impossible. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Now, if Jesus gave the command to walk and the man stayed on his cot, then Jesus would be a fake. He would have no power to forgive sin. He'd have no authority to heal diseases. But... If he gave the command and the man walked, then it shows he has authority. Then in like fashion, when he declared forgiveness, then forgiveness happened. The man knew he was forgiven. And Jesus said he did this. He healed the, the man so that you may know that the Son of Man has, has authority on earth to forgive sin. And I want you to notice something here. If our sins are to be forgiven, it must be while we are still on earth. It will be too late once we are under the earth and our sins are forgiven on earth by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Faith in Christ Jesus is the path that runs from earth to heaven. Unbelief is the path that runs from earth to hell. And there is no path that runs from hell to heaven. If our sins are to be forgiven, it must be while we are still on earth. 
And so here this paralytic experienced the power of the Lord in two ways. He first experiences cleansing power and he experiences healing power. The man had a new heart and new health. And I believe in the same way, we too can know the power of the Lord in this way. Psalm 103, verse 3. Well, it starts out, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And verse 3, Who pardons all your iniquities. Not just some of them. All of them. Who heals all your diseases. Not just some of them. All of them. But here's the thing. We may not experience complete healing on earth. But there is a day when we will be resurrected and receive glorified bodies, and at that point, all of our diseases will be healed. And so to be transformed by the message and the miracles of the Messiah, we must put our faith in the Lord Jesus. We must receive the forgiveness of our sin. And thirdly, we must walk in the fear of the Lord. In verse 12, he got up, and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. So that they're all amazed and we're glorifying God, saying we have never seen anything like this. Well, if we go to a parallel passage in Luke, <clears throat> Luke 5, 26, this is the same account that we're reading about in Mark. It's just from Luke's perspective. And notice what he says. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Now, the word fear has two senses to it. One is, you know, your, your fear of terror, your, your, your fear of, of harm or damage or, or being hurt. That's one aspect of fear. The other aspect of fear is a sense of awe and reverence. It has a sense of, of wonder, of worship. It includes an overwhelming sense of glory, beauty, and worth to God. For example, you may experience such a feeling when you look up at the nighttime sky and you're awed by the vastness of space and the billions of stars. I remember when I was an undergrad student and in biology, studying the biomedical sciences and reading my textbooks on cell biology and physiology and anatomy and all sorts of other ones. And, and I, was, I was a new Christian and I'd read this and I was like, wow, it's incredible what God has made. It just creates a sense of awe and reverence and worship of God. That's the fear of God. That's the fear of the Lord. It leads to worship. The fear of the Lord as it says in Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the way to godliness. And so in conclusion, great things happen when Jesus is in our midst. Every encounter with Jesus is a life-changing experience. <clears throat> because when Jesus is in the house. When Jesus is in our midst, we can be transformed by his message and by his miracles, by his word and by his works. And again, to be transformed by the message and miracles of the Messiah, we need to put our faith in the Lord Jesus. And if you haven't done that, as Jesus said, this was done so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sin on earth. This is the time to receive the forgiveness of sins. And so if you haven't put your faith in the Lord Jesus, do not delay. Admit that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again on on the third day, and call on him to be saved. We need to put our faith in the Lord Jesus. The second thing is, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus, then we receive his forgiveness. 
his forgiveness of our sin. The, the debt is paid, the guilt removed, the conscience is cleansed. And thirdly, we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. Why don't we pray? And Father, we thank you that you've made a way for us to encounter you. Lord, these four men brought this paralytic to you and you transformed this man. You forgave him of his sins and you healed his diseases. And I'm sure he went away not the same as, as when he was when he first met you. You have the power, Lord, to transform our lives. And I pray, Lord, that every one of us here in this sanctuary or listening online, that we would be transformed by you. That we would continue to be renewed in our minds, in our hearts, as we seek you, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Help us, Father, to, to come to you in your word and in prayer and worship. And as we come to you, as we encounter you, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in our lives. And for those that don't know you yet, they are like that paralytic man, helpless to come on his own. Lord, I pray that you would bring alongside others who can help to encounter Jesus whether friends or family members, whether even anyone listening to this message. We thank you, Lord, that you have power to forgive and authority to heal. Lord, let us not take you for granted. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.